Okay, I'd like to talk for about uh, 30 minutes, a little over 30 minutes, and then I'll open it up for questions. And I want to first give you a brief background about how this book came into being. And then I'll summarize or sketch out some of the main themes and uh, dramatize a few points, hopefully, hopefully whet your appetite so you want to read uh, the whole thing. And then thirdly, talk a little bit about the legacies of Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass for our lives today. Uh, I began writing this book shortly after Barack Obama launched his political campaign, and it was published on Election Day. And I feel like I have a very good understanding of what I call the Obama phenomenon, having immersed myself in both Douglas and Lincoln uh, during his campaign. Uh, Obama has been deeply influenced and inspired by both men, which I'll talk about a little bit at the end. <clears throat> it's often said that biographers re reveal as much about themselves as their subjects, and in my case, I plead guilty. Uh, I grew up in Iowa, Nebraska, and North Dakota in small towns, and one of the central experiences of my upbringing was moving. We moved K, um, K through 12th grade. I was in nine different schools, and there was a period between 5th and 10th grade in which I was in a different school every year. And one of the things that I latched on to uh, in the midst of all these moves was I, that I fell in love with uh, American literature and history, particularly the Civil War era. And I read, I first read Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln when I was about 14. And they both, in different ways, spoke to me, profoundly inspired me. Uh, I wanted to be like Frederick Douglass in certain respects, even though I didn't really understand the concept of race uh, in a way that I didn't really understand. Uh, I loved the way that they wrote. I loved the figures of speech. Um, that experience, having immersed myself in these two men and the literature around it, was one of the reasons that uh, brought me eventually to graduate school. And my first book uh, that came out of my dissertation focused on, it was called Black Hearts of Men, focused on two black and two white abolitionists who I argue forged bonds of friendship and alliance that were unprecedented in the Civil War era and would not be repeated until the Civil War Rights era. And during that period of researching the book, I realized that Frederick Douglass uh, met Abraham Lincoln three times in the White House. He was the first African American to meet a U.S. president on terms of near equality, was the first black to be advised by a U.S. president. And it was a story that uh, I found um, moving, dramatic, and a story that I wanted to tell. I also, um, both in my first book and even now, I'm very interested in the concept of interracial friendship. For me, interracial friendship is a symbol of democracy. Uh, it's a symbol of democracy because friendship throughout most of Western culture is defined, among other things, uh, in terms of near equality. So it's a symbol of what is possible in uh, American history. And Giants first, um, the first permutation of it was that I envisioned it as one chapter of this much larger book that I'm still working on, on interracial friendships in American culture. And that story first got published in Time magazine when Lincoln was featured on the cover in 2005. And I came to realize that the figures, the characters of Douglas and Lincoln loom so large that their story threatened to overwhelm all the other stories that I wanted to tell in that book. So I felt it was best to tell their story as a separate story, uh, which I did, and that's really how uh, the book came into being. And as I said, I had I'd been researching both Douglas and Lincoln for a long time and, and began writing soon after Obama launched his political campaign. Uh, the book traces what I found was in very surprising ways, they're parallel lives that ultimately converged. The unifying theme is that uh, Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln are the two preeminent self-made men in American history. Most of you know that, Fred, that Abraham Lincoln uh, grew up in, with very little in a log cabin. To say it was a log cabin was actually to romanticize it. It was really a three-sided hut. One side was open. Lincoln had less than a year of formal schooling. 
uh, and becomes, in my view, uh, the greatest president of the United States. And Frederick Douglass is born a slave, is prohibited from reading and writing, uh, and becomes uh, the preeminent orator of his day. Douglass, in his day, was far better known than Lincoln was. Uh, Lincoln does not become a nationally known figure until 1860. Frederick Douglass becomes famous overnight with the publication of his first autobiography, uh, which comes was published in part because he's such a good orator that people don't believe that he had ever been a slave. Uh, and both Douglass and Lincoln rose up on, for a number of reasons, but for more than anything else, their rise stemmed from their ability to use words as weapons and words and language and literacy as a way to to define and redefine and reshape themselves. And both virtually uh, memorized, read deeply in the same six authors or books before they ever met. Anyone want to guess what those texts are? The Bible is probably the most important. What else? Pardon? Columbian Order, very good. Columbian Order is a collection, an elocution manual, a collection of, of speeches from the classical era through the 19th century designed for young boys in particular to become orators. This was an age in which public speaking was one of the only forms of entertainment. Uh, it was analogous today of being a professional athlete, a rock star, a movie star. Uh, no matter where you started in life, if you could reach uh, the masses and convert them and speak to them and move them, uh, the, uh, you could rise uh, 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 to heights that, um, that, were, uh, that were virtually um, unimaginable from where you started. What was another book? And it's Shakespeare, the most popular writer of his day. So that's three. This is a great audience. <laughs> other, other thoughts? Aesop's Fables. Very good. You know what Aesop's Fables was? How would you define it? It's morals. Technically, Aesop's Fables is, can be seen as one of the earliest slave narratives. It's essentially their oral stories of slaves from classical Greece. They remain popular today, but that's the origin of their tales, Aesop's Fables. What else? Lord Byron, after Shakespeare, uh, the second most popular uh, orator of his day. Um, so these two men essentially memorize large chunks, and the, the six is Robert Burns' poetry. Um, Lincoln, in particular, uh, loved Burns' dialect. He identified with Burns as a farmer. Uh, Lincoln had this horrible uh, Illinois backwoods accent. In fact, when Lincoln was a young boy, he would have pronounced his name, and his neighbors would have pronounced his name Linkhorn. Uh, so the R's were... Uh, were, were emphasized, and uh, it sounded, uh, in fact, when they were both young boys learning from the Columbian Order how to be um, effective public speakers, one of the things that Caleb Bingham, the uh, editor of the Columbian Order, said was that it was important to speak and sound like a democratic gentleman, not an ignorant hick. And he taught, using examples going all the way back to classical antiquity, how to practice um, positioning your tongue so that you could lose your accents. And I convey a sense of what the young Frederick Douglass and what the young Lincoln actually sounded like, and it wasn't particularly pretty when they were young men, and how they over time were able to lose uh, mu much of their accent, although Lincoln even is a, in the White House retained something of the Illinois twang, uh, much to the shock of uh, Harvard and Yale educated uh, Easterners. Uh, so that the, the, uh, the one crucial parallel is this uh, rise through liter literacy. There are others, ironically, at the very moment in which both men are aspiring to be intellectuals and falling in love with literature, a crucial turning point in their young lives was a fight, a pretty brutal fight with an opponent. For those of you who've read Frederick Douglass, it was, his fight was with a slave breaker named Edward Covey, this man who was famous on the eastern shore of Maryland for breaking the will of slaves who were seen to be insolent. And Douglass, who was brought back to the eastern shore, now literate, was considered insolent because he looked his master in the eye, who had the audacity to speak back to him. And so his master, Thomas Ald, rented him out to Covey, who 
uh, tried to break Douglas's will, whipped him mercilessly, 